Our message is entitled, Crown Him Lord of All. And our scripture is from Colossians, the very first chapter, uh, verses 13 to 20. And I'm reading uh, from the Living Bible. For he has rescued us out of the darkness and gloom of Satan's kingdom and brought us into the kingdom of his dear son who bought our freedom with his blood and forgave us all our sins. Now listen to these next few verses. They're so powerful. Christ is the exact likeness of the unseen God. He existed before God made anything at all. And in fact, Christ himself is the creator who made everything in heaven and earth. The things we can see and the things we can't. The spirit world with its kings and kingdoms, its rulers and authorities, all were made by Christ for his own use and glory. He was before all else began, and it is his power that holds everything together. He is the head of the body made up of his people, that is, his church, which he began, and he is the leader of all those who arise from the dead, so that he is first in everything. For God wanted all of himself to be in his son. It was through what his son did that God cleared a path for everything to come to him, all things in heaven and on earth. For Christ's death on the cross has made peace with God for all by his blood. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word today. Well, it happened in the jungle one day. A lion with a big ego went around asking the other animals who was the king of the jungle. Who's the king of the jungle? The lion roared at the monkey. Why, you are, Mr. Lion, said the monkey with fear in his voice. The lion went on and found a zebra. Who's the king of the jungle? He snarled. There's no doubt about it. You are, Mr. Lion, said the zebra. Seeing a turtle. Crossing the path, the lion bellowed, who's the king of the jungle? Scared out of his shell, the turtle said, you are, Mr. Lion. You are the king of the jungle. Then the lion came upon an elephant. Once again, he roared out the question, who's the king of the jungle? And the elephant used his trunk to grab the lion by the tail. He spun him around over his head several times, dunked him in a mud hole, and slammed him into a large tree. Dazed and dirty, the lion said, just because you don't know the correct answer was no reason to get upset. Beloved, not everyone in the world and America recognizes who the king of the jungle is. And we live in a jungle today, don't we? It sure seems like one. We live in a jungle in this world, and there is a king. And some who don't recognize him for the person he is treats him badly. Will the real king please stand up? 
There is the man who thought he was king. There is a man they called the king. And there is a man who wears the name king. So will the real king please stand up? Who is the man who thought he was king? Well, I kind of think it was the ex-heavyweight boxing champion of the world, Muhammad Ali. Who is the man they called the king? Elvis. I heard that. <laughs> Elvis. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Elvis, the king of rock and roll music. And who is the man who wears the name king? Well, there might be several kings, but the one I was thinking of was Don King. The spiked hair and everything. He was a boxing promoter. In fact, I believe at one time he was Muhammad Ali's promoter. Will the real king please stand up? Obviously, from a spiritual standpoint, None of these men are the king. I thought Muhammad Ali was a great boxer. I really did. No doubt about it that he was, but he was certainly not the king. And Elvis Presley was a super singer. Millions upon millions loved him and his music, but he was not the king. And boxing promoter Don King was far from the king. Beloved, there's only one true king, and we know him. Listen to Revelation 19. I know we don't read a lot in Revelation, but listen to this. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Actually, there's more in these verses than we can even begin to comprehend or even try to explain. He is, however, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The song says it so well. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall and crown him Lord of all. And in our scripture today, Jesus is described in various ways. I don't know if you caught it or not. Which enforce the fact that he is king and needs to be crowned Lord of all. There were three things I noticed. Number one, he's the savior. Number two, he is the creator. And number three, he's the head man. So let's look at him. He is the Savior. Verses 13 and 14. <clears throat> For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. One time the famous evangelist Billy Sunday, he wrote to the mayor of a city that he was going to be visiting, and he asked for the names of people he knew who had spiritual problems and needed help and prayer. How surprised he was when he received from the mayor a city telephone directory. <laughs> 
What's that scripture say? Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The biggest problem that all of us face in life is sin. We may need money. We may need a house. We may need a car or clothing, but our biggest problem is dealing with sin. And our biggest need is to have that taken away, isn't it? At a missionary station among some of the tribes of South Africa, the question was asked, do we possess anything that we have not received of God? And a little girl just five years of age answered immediately, yes, sir, sin. What a smart girl. Dr. Walker Wilson, ever always on the alert to speak to men about their souls, asked an attendant at a service station who just filled his car with gas. Do you remember those days? I was just thinking about that. When's the last time you ever stopped at a service station and an attendant came out and filled up your car? 1902, somewhere along. <clears throat> so, service man came, he said, and this is what he said to him. How did sin get in Sinclair? And he pointed to the sign atop the gas pump. Do you remember Sinclair gas? I think it had a dinosaur on it, and there's a couple of dinosaurs on 19. Did you notice that? They might be old Sinclair station. The guy says, I don't know, sir, how sin got into Sinclair but sir, I have wished many times that I knew how to get sin out of my life. How? We know, but some people don't. A girl named Angie Smith wrote, while working in a new pizzeria, I was surprised to find that many people have never eaten pizza. One customer admitted this when she came in for a takeout order. I explained our menu, took great care in helping her make her decision. After baking her pie to a nice golden brown, I sliced it and I slid it carefully into a box. I hope you enjoy your first pizza, I said. Thank you, she replied, and she promptly tucked it under her arm as she left. Can you, can you believe that anyone wouldn't know what a pizza is and wouldn't know how to carry it in a box? It's not any different. And some people today, when it comes to overcoming sin, many people, if not most, don't know what to do about it or how to overcome it and be forgiven from it. Many people just wallow in their sin instead of getting relief from it and forgiveness for it. They can't get out of it. A German scholar said, if I were God, this world of sin and suffering would break my heart. And it did. How did that go again? For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is the answer. Always has been always will be. He's the only answer to man's sin. Jesus' death on the cross is the cure. And I know from a purely human perspective, it makes no sense to believe that one man's death on a cross could cure our sins. But from God's perspective, it's possible. And people must believe in Christ and what he did on the cross 
and surrender to him in order to be forgiven and overcome their sin. So Christ is the Savior. Crown him Lord of all. Second, he is the creator. In verses 15 to 17, he is the image, remember, of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the image of the invisible God. Like father, like son. Can you name some famous sons who looked a lot like their fathers? You know, some people said Real Roger Jr. did, Peter Fonda did, and some others. But if there ever was a son who imitated his father in every way, it was Jesus. What's that wonderful verse in John 14, 9, when Jesus said, anyone who has seen me has what? Seen the Father. Wow. Did you know that when a beaver builds the entrance to his home, he always takes into account how thick the ice will be next winter. And even though ice thickness may vary from winter to winter, the beaver never misses. How is it possible that he never misses the mark? Did you know that butterflies never try to fly until their bodies reach exactly 81 degrees Fahrenheit? If they did, the material on their wings would come off. How do they know when it's exactly 81 degrees? Last week, I had to see my doctor for my checkup. And while I waited in the room for the doctor, you know, the two and a half hours, My, my doctor isn't here today, is he? I don't, I don't see him. Either. I noticed that he had on the wall two pictures of the internal workings of the human body. You know, the stomach, the intestines, the small and large intestine, the colon, all the other, all the other stuff. And I stood there and I studied in amazement, trying to figure how everything works and gets through all that maze. And I was again amazed, and I marveled. He's the creator. And finally, he's the head man. In the 18th verse, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. Now, it was said that those who worked with President Dwight D. Eisenhower found him that he was a very bright man. He was tough, and he was commanding. But Ike liked to verbalize his leadership role in a softer way. He said, I'm not the one of the desk-pounding type that likes to stick out his jaw and look at his, and, and boss other people around. I would rather get in the background and recognizing the frailties and requirements of human nature, try to persuade a man to go along. Because once I have persuaded him, he will stick. If I scare him, he will stay just as long as he is scared, and then he is gone. I like Ike. Do you remember that phrase? I like Ike. I remember that even as a little kid. But I can't, and I, I can't say whether Ike was good or perhaps a great president or not, but I like his philosophy. In my opinion, 
A good leader is one who is supportive of his people and tries to encourage them as best he or she can. But I think we would all agree that not all leaders are good leaders. Many years ago, while serving one small church, one of the board members came up to me and said, Reverend Trumbo, we need to change the evening worship time from 7 to 6. Well, I said, we'll need to talk to the board about it. He replied, I am the board. <laughs> and he proceeded to change the time for the evening service. Recently, I heard this story about a young Baptist minister who started a new ministry. He was stopped by one man in the church before he ever started preaching his first Sunday. The man said, I run this church. I have money. I sent the last preacher packing and I can do the same thing to you unless you do what I tell you to. Now, what do you think of that? Shocking. You want to know what happened? Well, I was told that the young preacher went into the pulpit, called for the immediate congregational meeting. He told the congregation what the man had just said to him. And he asked for dismissal for that man from the board and from the membership of the church. Someone in the church gave a second to the motion. The congregation voted and he was gone. So be it. There is only one head of the body of Christ. And we must crown him Lord of all. Not too long ago, I heard one of the most wonderful stories about an elderly black woman who didn't learn to read till she was well over 60. And the reason she learned to read was because she wanted to read the Bible. She is just a beautiful person. I mean, a person full of love, full of life, full of joy. She was a member of a small church and and the members of her church joined other churches in the college town, and they had a union worship service. The people from the college campus also were there. And there was a time in the service where people were getting up, expressing their thanksgiving, you know, kind of giving a little testimony. And this woman got up because she was felt moved to do so. But when she looked out and saw all the PhDs, all the other educated people, she froze in her anxiety and finally was able to say only, I know that my Redeemer lives, for he lives in my soul. Glory. Hallelujah. And she sat back down. Well, there was a deep silence. Everyone knowing that something very beautiful had just happened. Then the minister said, what our sister in Christ has just said is the final word that the human spirit has to say about the meaning of life and the meaning of God. I rejoice to be in her fellowship, and I can only repeat her words for myself. I know that my Redeemer lives, for he lives in my soul. Glory, hallelujah. Think of this, beloved. Jesus wrote no poetry, but Dante, Milton, 
and scores of the world's greatest poets were inspired by him. Jesus composed no music. Still, Hayden, Handel, Beethoven, Bach, Mendelssohn reached their highest perfection of melody in the hymns and in the music they composed in his praise. Every aspect of human greatness has been enriched by this humble carpenter of Nazareth. How do those words go again? All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem, let me hear you, and crown him Lord. 